everybody. Welcome to the Abroaders Travel Podcast, your weekly meetup with thousands of entrepreneurs, hustlers, creators, nomads, ninjas, wanderers, and world changers, all seeking to build the skills and connections to live a life without borders. If you want to learn more about what we do or download our entire podcast archive, check out the website, abroaders.com. Happy Thursday morning and welcome to another episode of the Abroaders podcast. This is episode 198 for Thursday, December 7th, 2017. A uh, quick happy birthday to my mom. Happy uh, birthday, Chris. I don't think she listens, at least based yeah. on the questions I get from her. If she ever <laughs> listens, she, she probably doesn't pay attention. Um, and so today we've got some pretty interesting news stories to cover on today's show. A couple of them that are more or less outside of the points and miles world. But I want to get your take on a couple of these things. Uh, some interesting technology stuff that came out this we week. We do. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some supersonic travel. Yeah. Uh, some loop travel as far as uh, airport transit goes to and from airport in the city. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into those things. Absolutely. So we've also got some points and miles related stories. Uh, top stories for this week. Delta raises prices, takes it back, then raises some other prices. We'll talk about what that means and what it might foreshadow is actually coming. Uh, we've also got Flying Blue Promo Awards for travel in February, uh, which is a little bit of a flip from the last round of promo awards. So we're going to talk about that. And we've also got an announcement from Discover that they've slashed a major set of benefits that come with most cards uh, across their entire portfolio. So it's not one or two cards, it's all Discover cards. Uh, there's going to be a big change. And I want to cover that because a lot of other cards from Chase and Amex and City also offer these benefits. And it's one of the ones that many people don't know about. In fact, that's why Discover is saying that they're getting rid of the benefits that not enough people use them. Um, so we're going to talk that. And then the last piece is Amex and Chase have done a deal uh, with Marriott. So it looks like both of them are going to get a slice of that portfolio. Uh, so we'll talk about what that means. Finally, the core content for today is about points valuations. Uh, there are lots of different approaches to this. One of the more consistent blogs as far as publishing information about points valuations is the points guy. And so we're gonna talk about the December valuations that just came out and the points guys methodology. And then to try and put that in context, give you guys some information from our booking service on what we're seeing people actually get for their points in a bunch of the categories that the points guy rates. All right, so before we get into everything, I wanna do two quick reminders. The first one is that the transfer relationship from City to Hilton is gonna be ending on December 13th. Um, so there's not too much time left to take advantage of that. And so we're gonna put in the show notes uh, some information that might help you decide if you happen to have a lot of city points, it could be worthwhile. Typically hotel points are not the place to mm -hmm. be using transferable currencies, but Hilton allows bookings 365 days in advance. So if you're looking at this transfer deadline, it could be useful for travel up to a full year out. And Hilton's got 5,000 properties, 800,000 rooms, and a huge footprint over 100 different yeah. countries. I mean, I see this making sense if somebody's got a bunch of city points that they wouldn't be able to use for airfare. They've got that many. Then I think it's a good check down where the, the dollar value you get per point is probably not going to be there. But uh, there's no point in just holding on to a yeah. bunch of points. So two resources to make your life easy. Number one is a map of all Hilton hotels by category. Uh, this is something that Drew from Travel is Free put together and it's awesome, you can filter. Um, so the lowest category price is 5,000 points a night, which is a great deal, or 2,000 points a night plus 30 bucks cash and points. So if you wanna think about using these points, you can just filter that map and see all the locations right. that are the lowest price. Um, so we're gonna have that included. The other reminder uh, is about IHG, and this is actually for tomorrow, December 8th. And so IHG has a 100% bonus on purchase points. It's not as exciting as it sounds. Basically what it means is that if you're looking at the lowest category, which is 10,000 points a night, mm -hmm. you can buy points and get a room for $57 a night. So there's definitely some scenarios where that works. And once again, in the show notes, we're gonna have a complete map of all the IHG properties, categories one through 11 that you can filter. So you can see where the locations are. And I was actually surprised there's a lot of category one, two, and three hotels that are in major cities. 
Um, so Barcelona, Madrid, oh, that is, uh, that is Frankfurt, surprising. like uh, maybe not London and New York, but there are places where you could get 47 or $57 a night hotels by buying points uh, that could be worthwhile. So well, shit, if anyone's going to Barcelona, hotels in Barcelona are really expensive, which is very yeah. odd because Barcelona is not a particularly expensive city, but the hotels are very expensive that's like the cost of a hostel is like 57 dollars yeah. all right so those resources the uh the points maps and the uh pricing chart are going to be in the show notes at broaders.com slash 198 uh let's talk about some of those technology stories that we've got this week yeah man we've got a few of them uh let's let's start off the one i'm least excited about but i still think is worth uh, mentioning uh, and this is with emirates triple seven uh they've got a couple of technological features that are, are new and one of them is windows on the middle suite <laughs> in their premium cabin think so, about that for a minute how, so, how does that work so you normally think think about a business class or first class configuration where you've got we'll just talk business class so you've got the you know the windows on the right the windows on the left and then the person in the middle doesn't have windows in emirates suites they do have windows they're not a real window but it's a virtual window where it's a projection of what you'd see outside so when you're sitting in the suite you can see outside and you can see what is really outside but it's essentially just like a, an hd screen that looks like a window in your little pot yeah it's pretty interesting i mean i think one one piece of this is just the technology that they're they're using cameras on top of the plane right. to show you what is actually outside the plane so you are seeing a live feed mm -hmm. of that information and and the report in here is that you know the the fake windows are actually much higher really, really higher nice. resolution yeah. that's one of the things that you know most of the flight there's not that much to see but most windows on planes are grimy you know it's a couple yeah, of different right. layers of plastic glass so i thought this was kind of interesting the bigger news is that this uh this emirates suite looks looks pretty awesome looks great um so that's something it's a certainly an aspirational award i don't think that these new suites are bookable with any type of points right now it's it's very inventory controlled but uh that's something to look forward to in the future as the hype dies down we'll mm -hmm. probably see these uh bookable with some different points emirates is partners with japan airlines which is a transfer of SPG as well as Alaska. Um, so there are some points that you might be able to get this once they open up the seats. Yeah, staying on the technology theme, uh, some interesting stuff with smart bags and traveling <laughs> on planes. So uh, we've got some more US-based airlines that are no longer going to allow smart bags in any capacity, checking it or carrying it on. Uh, because of the concern of uh, lithium batteries and having fires in the cargo space. And that's obviously a much worse scenario than having a, a little fire in the actual cabin where somebody could go put it out. Somebody's trained to go put it out. Um, so the folks that make these uh, these bags, I'm curious how they are going to handle this. Yeah. So originally, it looks like Americans said that they weren't going to allow mm -hmm. these bags to be checked. And then shortly afterwards, the other big airlines in the U.S. at least ban this. I think now Delta and United have said that they're. Uh, they're I think it, I don't know. I thought United was a holdout, but they may follow suit. Oh, you're like right. JetBlue, it's, it's Alaska. Okay, Alaska uh, and right. Delta have, have followed yeah. suit. And and you know, so basically, like the if you happen to have one of these bags, I think the the news is that if it doesn't have batteries that can be removed, so right. either like disposable batteries uh -huh. or a lithium battery that you can take out. And this is going to start in January, January right? Uh, I think they're good. I think they're given a little bit of lead time. Yeah, January fifteenth. Okay, so but I mean that's that's coming up, and that's a that's a big wrinkle for anybody that's on the cutting edge of technology and has a smart bag. So I mean, as a startup founder, I feel for for the people that that put this in play, and you know, it was just months ago that they were talking about not letting people have laptops on in the cabin of airplanes and putting them in the cargo and putting them in the cargo hold and i was really worried about that and thinking like that is a disaster waiting to happen so it seems like the the thinking has gone even further i guess on the bright side that's probably uh further reinforcement that we won't yeah. be forced to check our laptops anytime soon mm -hmm. Um, so next up, we've got uh, a story. The reason that Boom Supersonic is in the news is that Japan Airlines has made uh, an investment of $10 million uh, into this supersonic uh, carrier. And so their, their model is basically to roll out a new supersonic jet uh, that has some pretty impressive stats. Yeah, I think the way, to, the way to think of it is like for anyone that remembers the Concorde, kind of like that, but way better. 
Yeah, like uh, essentially the problems that the Concorde had were it was very inefficient with fuel, which made it really expensive. It was loud. It was, it, there was some issues. Uh, so this one, they claim that it's going to be 30 times quieter yeah. than the Concorde. Uh, and they also uh, are looking at a cruising speed of more than two times the speed of sound. So 1,450 miles yeah, an so hour. Essentially, we're talking about having the cruising speed be close to close to three times that of the yeah. best of what you're Boeings and Airbuses on the market. So, you know, West Coast to Tokyo right now is about 14 hours, maybe 13, 15, depending on yeah. direction of travel. Uh, that's going to cut that down to about five hours, five hours and yeah. a half. Um, when, and now, this is a ways out. So uh, these guys the mid, have the mid 2020s. Interesting. Uh, Richard Branson, uh, the Virgin Group, uh, was the first one to kind of get on board, and they optioned the the first ten planes, uh, right. which I imagine passed over in the acquisition with uh, with Alaska. But uh, there's yeah. definitely interest from major airlines. That's in I this would product. imagine why Japan Airlines gave them ten million bucks is because Japan Airlines has the right to. They essentially get a preferred spot on the wait list. Yeah. So uh, they they have the rights for. Which, which, mind you, I mean a new A380 costs I don't know six hundred million dollars or something like that. So ten million dollars. They're not building anything with ten million dollars. This is you know research and development I would imagine or just kind so of what, a, what they a said token is, investment. What boom said is they they have been working closely with japan airlines for the past year and japan airlines has worked with them in the capacity of what does the in-flight experience look like where boom has the tech to make the damn thing work and japan airlines has the experience with actually what does it look like to transport people what do people want what do yeah. people need it seems kind of like common sense but i think it's smart on boom to not try to do something that they've never done japan airlines has done that for a hell of a lot longer than them yep um i'm curious to see what kind of uh what kind of funding Boom Supersonic has gotten? I'm, I'm pulling it up on AngelList right now. That should probably give us a snapshot. I'm guessing uh, they don't have any any funding listed. But like you said, ten million bucks doesn't build Dropping the cutting the edge plane. It's nothing. But uh, interesting. Uh, I'm curious what valuation that was based on or how that deal worked. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Uh, so you know, hopefully in the the early 2020s, we might be seeing uh, supersonic jets making a comeback. And uh, one final thing I think is relevant is as far as how much is this going to cost. They claim that they are projecting the cost to be about that of business class right now. Wow. More or less. I mean, and it's a lot less crappy to sit in economy if you're going that fast and you can right. get to Asia in five hours. Like, I don't mind a five-hour economy flight. I mind a 20-hour economy flight. Yeah. But. I think there, like with the Concord too, I think there will be, if they can pull this off, there will be some novelty. Yeah. Like, like, wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. I, I mean, I think it would be a cool experience, but uh, even if it wasn't like the best travel experience I think it'd be interesting to go 1500 miles an hour and I'd be, be curious what cruising altitude is at that because yeah. didn't the Concorde fly extra high I don't know I really because don't. that's the thing with flying a plane the higher you fly the uh, the less the air faster, pressure right? or yeah, exactly. the less resistance for sure uh, all right, so last story on the technology front is about Chicago O'Hare, which overall is is one of the oldest, more most outdated, kind of tough, big airports in the U.S. Uh -huh. uh, it's a place that I try not to connect if I can if I can help it. Uh, United Hub, and uh, so the story here is that uh, one of the companies that is I think at least partially owned by Elon Musk. I kind of lose track because he's got he's got all Solar kinds City of Tesla. Uh, then there's SpaceX. SpaceX. Yeah. So they are, you know, basically have announced that they want to put in a bid on this high speed transit system uh, from the, the downtown loop uh, in Chicago to O'Hare. So typically, you know, you're looking at uh, as much as an hour ride on public transit as it stands now. Mm -hmm. O'Hare, one of the nice things is that it is connected to the subway system. So you're not forced to take a taxi or a, a ride share right. car out there. Um, but they're looking at getting the, the transport time from downtown to around 20 minutes. Uh, if this happens, one of the other things that'll be interesting is if you end up needing to connect from Chicago to Midway, uh, that makes a very different picture in as far as connection time that's mm -hmm. workable. Uh, that's one of the things I, I hate because Southwest is so good for positioning flights, mm -hmm. where uh, but it eliminates Miami because Miami's got Southwest out in, yeah. in Fort Lauderdale. I wonder, like, did, I wonder, do you think anyone thinks that's a priority though? Because how like 
how, how many instances is somebody flying into O'Hare and flying out of Midway? Oh, no, I don't think it has anything yeah. to do with why they're doing this, but immediately, like, points and miles thinking. So, like, the airports that are hard, so Southwest is, you know, really good for domestic travel. It's easy. You can cancel it at the last sure. minute. And so I use it all the time for positioning flights. Right. The places that it doesn't work are Dallas because mm-hmm. Southwest is out of love. Mm-hmm. Houston because they're out of hobby mm-hmm. instead of Bush International. Uh, Miami because they're out of Fort Lauderdale and Chicago because they're right. out of Midway. Um, so it just kind of occurred to me. Yeah, I've yeah. done that transit and it took me like two hours mm-hmm. uh, in traffic. I probably should have taken uh, the Metro, but that's, you know, with bags right. and stuff. So anyways, I hope uh, hope this project happens. Uh, interestingly enough, though, they're asking for bids, but uh, I'm pretty sure that I read that they're basically expecting the company to pay for it that is doing the bid. Yes, I think that was what Elon Musk said, something along the lines of we plan to fund, build, and blah, 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 where... I think that's probably a good way to do it because I would imagine there would be a little bit of a troll toll. Like, Elon, I, I, there's there's some reason that Elon Musk wants to do this. I don't know if you, you get to take the revenue and then the city's key because you'll pay tax. I don't know, but uh, uh, I guess that's better than the, the pro sports stadium approach to public financing where yeah, the city sure. pays for some jerk billionaire stadium to be built that he makes money on. Yeah. All right, so last up before we get into the real news and updates regarding points, I wanted to give a quick shout out to JT Genter. He writes uh, for the Points Guy, also a member of the Broaders community. And Delta just really, really let it go this time with a press release declaring that they had no canceled flights over the Thanksgiving weekend. They were perfect, batting a thousand, just were the best. And uh, so JT posted a great article that just breaks it down. Like, ah, well, I don't know if anybody else noticed, but they did cancel a flight. Uh, So, And Delta gave a pretty limp answer as to why they, they didn't see it as a canceled flight. They saw it as a delay, even though the flight no longer went out and people had to wait a day. Yeah, like I it mean, was an 18 hour cancellation. Mm-hmm. So uh, anyways, JT, thanks for keeping Delta honest. Uh, on to points and miles, let's stay with Delta yeah. for a minute. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, not the best news here. Delta uh, over the weekend basically increased prices for flights from the US to Europe uh, in business class. So the business class on Delta Metal uh, has been 70000 for a while, which is still above the price on quite a few other mm-hmm. uh, competitors in terms of points required. They moved that up to 86000 and then quickly changed it back. And so the reason that I wanted to report on this is that the last time that happened, it was basically just a premature release of future pricing plans. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there's a very decent chance that you'll see Delta Metal flights uh, from the U.S. Europe and business class go up from seventy to eighty-six thousand on one way. But even Zinn, I mean, if, if, that's if you could find one for seventy thousand, where they uh, their it's pricing hard. is dynamic. Because I was just I was just toying around on the website. I mean, you, you get an itinerary is one hundred and four thousand for a round trip in economy, one hundred and thirty-seven five. Like th- their prices are all over the place because they've got a different method. They don't they don't abide by an actual chart. Yeah. Uh, in other news, they did increase the prices, or at least it seems so at this point uh, for South Asia. South Asia, uh, for Delta at least, is like Bangladesh, India, the Maldives, and uh, Sri Lanka. And so for other programs, I think United considers those countries in, in their Central Asia region. But overall, it's one of the more expensive places points and miles wise to get from the US and North America. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was a pretty big increase. So beforehand, the price was 97,500 one way, and it's now gone up to 120,000 one way. Uh, Again, we might see that 97,500 price poke back out, but Mm -hmm. uh, I went through several months of availability and uh, it looks like we might have a new floor on on the price. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Delta's leadership, their their CEO has the most militant attitude against award (laughs) redemptions on premium cabin space compared to the others, where I think his quote in the last month is something like, it's just stupid business to give away your most expensive product for free. And it's like, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but at the same time, I mean. It's not for free though. You're making billions of dollars from Amex when right, they yeah, buy yeah, your yeah. points and you're making a ton of money. Uh, just like, 
it's hiding the ball. Um, and you know, they're, they're certainly entitled to do it, but it makes Delta points a lot less attractive to me and my business, my spend is going to other programs. And so I think as people get more educated, this may catch up to them. I really hope that the other programs hold the line because when one of the major leaders, especially in the U S market goes in that direction, it makes it easier. It paves the way for United and American and Frankly, those guys have a history of following Delta. They are definitely more leaders and followers. Uh, Well, moving on and and staying within the Sky team, uh, we've got Air France Promo Awards. So uh, it's something they do every month. Kind of the quick summary is you got to book travel within essentially a certain month for travel within another window of time. I think it could deviate a little bit, but it's generally... This one actually has one exception. Uh, I think the JFK uh, flight is... Yes, through March March. 31st. So uh, what this month looks like is... If you book an Air France promo award between December 1st and 31st, so right now, uh, and then the travel between all, pretty much all of February, other than flights from New York to Paris on Air France, that's through March 31st. Mm-hmm. Um, but what we've got here that's notable from North America, thanks to the thanks to One Mile at a Time, kind of summarizing this for us is uh, Calgary to Europe in KLM business class. That'll be a 25% discount, which means the price is going to be under 50,000 points. So. Uh, I think 46875 would be the exact math. So call yep. it 47,000. Uh, Edmonton to Europe in KLM business class. New York to Paris on Air France operated flights. And then Vancouver to Europe. So these are all going to be 25% uh, discounts. So all under 50,000 one way. And it's also nice because Air France takes all the four transferable points. Yep. Uh, so the one thing to remember, the New York one is probably gonna be the most relevant for, for folks in the mm-hmm. US. And uh, that one's to the other airport in Paris. So it's to Orly, Orly yeah. uh, which I don't know geographically if that's uh, a positive or a negative, but just something to be aware of that yeah. if you're connecting uh, to another flight somewhere else in Europe, which is, uh, that's a really good way to use promo awards, in my opinion, is to, to fly in and then you know grab a cheap paid flight on sure. a low cost carrier. So something to be aware of, you're not going to the main international airport, which is Charles de Gaulle. Um, But those are now bookable on Air France's website. Last round of promo awards was for economy uh, destinations Mm -hmm. in North America. So uh, this one's a little bit different, uh, but it's definitely a great value, especially if you compare it to the the 85,000 that Delta wants to charge you for a business class ticket. All right. uh, So next up, we've got news about Discover Card. Uh, We'll keep this one kind of brief because we've talked about this type of benefit before in the past, but um, the reasoning that Discover gave for removing these benefits is that their cardholders weren't utilizing them. And so I really hope that this doesn't happen uh, and doesn't catch on with other programs. In fact, so the the benefits are uh, basically the purchase protection type benefits. So that means extended warranty with most cards means that if your manufacturer warranties a year, you get an extra year tacked on where if something Something breaks, mm-hmm. the bank, the issuer of your credit card will reimburse you. Right. I've used that on my MacBook and got like eight hundred dollars to repair the screen. Um, I've had that, you know, many different scenarios where that can pay off big time. Uh, return guarantee. That one almost came up for me the other day at Best Buy. <laughs> yeah. uh, apparently, they have a fifteen day return policy, and so uh, yeah, I went into to Best Buy, and um, you know, if they had not accepted my return, uh, Chase would have covered that for me. So they've eliminated that, and they've also eliminated auto rental insurance purchase protection, which means if you drop your you know new iPhone within sixty or ninety days, most credit cards will give you a replacement or cover the cost of buying a new one. So these are benefits that you have to call and file a claim. There's a little bit of paperwork, but for big purchases, it can be worth hundreds of dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I don't have any Discover cards now. They're not yeah. particularly attractive for points and miles, but uh, it's important news to be aware of. And I wanted to bring up the story just because uh, almost all major credit cards have some of these benefits. Um, it varies a little bit, especially with the travel related ones like bag insurance and delay and interruption insurance. But get uh, the PDF from your credit card issuer. It's usually what comes out in the packet when you originally mm-hmm. receive the card. And it'll tell you what those benefits are. I would say I, in my lifetime, I've probably saved three or $4,000 by filing claims mm-hmm. uh, over those those services. So uh, I think this cuts out uh, February 28th of next year for Discover. So something to keep in mind, I would not use a Discover card to purchase anything important because you don't have any protection that way. Yeah. Uh, well, staying on the theme of uh, credit cards, some interesting news with Marriott where 
they're taking a page out of American Airlines book and they're, they're uh, I don't know, they're dating a couple people at the same time. Chase and American Express are going to have cards with Amex. Um, kind of interesting how this works out where Chase is going to be kind of at the bottom of the market, Amex is going to be at the top of the market, where the way that they put it is just bogus. So they're saying that Chase is going to offer mass consumer and premium consumer cards, which is going to be a no or low annual fee and a lower annual fee -ish consumer card, not a business card. And then Amex is going to offer what they're considering super premium, which could be like a $450 annual fee with a bunch of benefits, and then a small business card. So American Express is going to have a business card with Marriott. They're going to have a high annual fee, high benefit card. And then Chase is going to have two consumer cards for individuals with a lower no annual fee and a lower annual fee. Yep. And no details so far. So no. we're going to find out about this. The other good news is that, and I mentioned this briefly last week, but uh, they expect that they will not be merging the programs until the very end of 2018 at the earliest. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you can expect Starwood Preferred Guests to hold its own and, and uh, those Starwood yeah. points should it's, still be transferable. It's going to be interesting to see how this works where I feel like Amex and Chase are a little bit more this is a little bit more of a fair fight than City and Barclay with American Airlines where the way that the Barclay and the City thing worked with American is um, Barclay had to kind of take a back seat to City with yes. uh, some of the advertising and some of the partnership stuff they could do where it'll be interesting to see if Amex and and, uh, and excuse me Chase get to play equally one announcement that we actually didn't even have in our outline, but uh, this just uh, the Amex just reminded me of this. Uh, we've seen some reports that the card match tool uh, through creditcards.com is offering a 100,000 point bonus on the Amex Platinum card. Um, so that's one I actually, I think we have a link uh, that we get credit if you get approved. So I'm going to double check. We I already have the card match tool from Okay. Account, so right? I, I already have the Platinum card, so I wasn't able to see if I was, I, I won't be targeted because I already have it, but uh, uh, it seems like it's relatively widespread. If you've never had the Amex Platinum personal card in the past, uh, you might be able to get it and be in a spot where you could get 100,000 points. And I think the spending amount is really reasonable. I think it's like four or $5,000, okay. uh, right. which other times in the past, the, the sign up requirement has been like ten or $20,000. Right. Um, so we'll put a link to that. Definitely worth a look. Um, the bonus doesn't get much better than that. So uh, if you're eligible for it and qualify, uh, I'd, I'd go yeah, for it. Yeah, worth, worth taking advantage of. All right, so last item today is about points valuation. So to start off, uh, I want to say that the information that's out there is very, very, very much dependent on where you want to travel and uh, just the type of tickets you buy, whether you book in economy, whether you book in business class, whether you're looking for only direct flights versus you don't mind making stops. So everybody is different. And uh, so that's number one thing to keep in mind. What we're gonna be talking about today is a little bit about the points guy and the valuations because he puts out points valuations every month. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I think is helpful about the points guys method is that uh, the month to month changes typically are in the direction that I agree with. In, in other words, if he says that this valuation went down, normally there's a good reason where they lost a partner or availability has tightened up. And so using it as sort of a yeah. directional thing where um, taking a look at a year ago and seeing what the valuation was then, and then taking a look at now, uh, the direction of the points guy's valuation generally is something that I agree with. Um, now, the other thing is he explicitly says that this is not based on data from booking tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on essentially how much he would buy those points for. Right. Um, Which I think is philosophically, logically is one fair way to look at it. But mm -hmm. kind of the, the Broaders method, we at least try to attach it to real travel um, and, and the real dollar values that flights would have cost. Uh, so I think the bottom line here is apples to oranges in this mm -hmm. comparison. We're not saying that the points guy is wrong. I would use his valuations if you're thinking about buying miles. I would never pay what we get in terms of value uh, with our booking service right. to buy miles because then you're just breaking even. Right. Uh, yeah, so yeah. the one the one thing that uh, that I can't look past with the point guy's valuations that I just don't get is Delta 1.2, American 1.4. Yeah. I, yeah, really? They're not close. They're not no. even close. Uh, so 
a couple of sort of updates just to recap some of the things that have happened recently that have affected points valuations, at least for the points guy, uh, have been Singapore uh, today, actually, as the show airs, has increased their award prices for Star Alliance partner bookings. Mm -hmm. They've also done a really nice thing. And uh, now at the moment of recording, I haven't been able to check this out. But uh, as of today, you should be able to book those partner tickets online rather than calling Singapore's mm -hmm. call center, uh, which is a nice value add. Uh, United has uh, added short haul flights, so uh, there's a discount now. It's about eight thousand for a lot of different good, short flights, uh, and that's been missing uh, from Star Alliance. You know, mm -hmm. British Airways covers that for One World partners, but there hasn't until now really been a program that had more affordable uh, pricing for shorter flights. Uh, on the flip side, back earlier this year, this summer, uh, United raised award prices uh, for a couple of different regions, mm -hmm. especially business and first class. Um, Chase has lost a little bit of value due to the United and Singapore valuations. Right. Um, and then Avianca just came on board as a city transfer partner, uh, which is really good news. By the way, I don't think I ever reported back on this. My test transfer that I ran from city took a full six days to post to Life Miles. So it's not yeah. going to be a program that you can trust if there's only one or two seats. But the good news is that Avianca tells you how many seats are available. So like I was looking at flights the other day mm -hmm. and I could see that there were eight seats in economy. Um, so that's helpful, at least that you know whether you're looking at the last seat and right. you know making that transfer is really risky because anybody could book it mm -hmm. or there's a bunch of seats and you know you can Actually, roll the in dice. In a perfect world, if you got a boatload of points, you just toss some points over there. Yeah, have them have them available, have them ready to ready to book. Yeah, I do that for the the short haul. Like I, you know, to me it makes a lot of sense uh, for positioning and connecting flights. Uh, and by the way, Avianca also has uh, something similar to United where short flights tend to be a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. We talked a couple of weeks ago when we announced this this uh, transfer partner relationship about the different zones within the U.S. and being right. able to, to work some some deals there. So for, for shorter flights, you know, it makes sense to have it. It's just when you've got uh, a business class round trip kind of ticket, that's a lot of points to, to park in Avianca's yeah. program. I wouldn't I wouldn't think about doing that. All right, so uh, now that we've talked a little bit about the, the methodology, let me kind of give you a quick rundown of our methodology for evaluating points. So ours is exclusively based on booking data. We don't say, ah, uh, we like this program, ah, uh, they, you know, we're not looking at award uh, availability per se. So the numbers that we're saying are every time we've found a ticket successfully for where somebody wants to go, we've taken a look at the total amount of money that was saved, which is just how much does the ticket cost to buy, mm -hmm. subtract whatever they paid in taxes and fees, right. and that's the savings, and then we divide that by the number of points used. Mm -hmm. So it's a super simple mathematical formula, um, but that gives us a look at what the valuation actually is on redemption. Um, so the big caveat here is that if I tell you what our valuation is for Delta and what our valuation is for United, it's not going to be reflective of the fact that Delta very, very rarely offers tickets at the lowest price when we're booking them. So in other words, it doesn't account for award availability things. Yeah. We only book so, Delta. So I guess the way you can kind of consume these valuations is, because uh, I guess, spoiler alert, um, Delta points are, we would value them more than United as far as the actual dollar savings. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that one Delta mile is going to get you as far as a United mile. Right. And the reason for that is because Delta flights are generally more expensive than United flights. Yeah. And so I think, you know, like the, the key takeaway for me from these valuations is, number one, I want to share the average taxes that you're going to pay on a booking with each of these types of mm -hmm. points. So we've got the economy taxes and the premium cabin. So that's business and first. Right. And we've split those out because in some cases they're pretty similar and in some cases they're very different. Um, and then the other takeaway here is just that um, so this is almost exclusively based on booking saver level tickets. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless like there's a couple of clients that we have that have so many points that like they'll pay extra for a direct flight or something sure. like that. But this is kind of like if you use the points the way they're supposed to be used and 
most of the time, we've got folks that have good diversification where they've mm-hmm. got the option of if Delta is available, absolutely book right. for Delta because it's harder to find. But if American or Singapore or somebody else, uh, it gives us a chance to get them the best possible deal by minimizing the number of points they're paying and also minimizing the, the out-of-pocket mm-hmm. taxes and fees. Right. Um, okay, so let's run through this. Uh, we've got a valuation. The only one that we agree with the points guy, which is kind of an obvious answer anyways, uh, is for Southwest. Um, so Southwest has a price that's actually based on the cost of the ticket. Right. Um, so ours, Southwest doesn't have business class. So the economy value we've got is about 1.6. Uh, taxes average about 15 bucks. It's normally going to be $11.20 for domestic. It's a little more expensive for mm-hmm. international. And that's one thing, too, that we, uh, I don't know if you said this, but we calculate the taxes and fees into the equation. Yes. Yeah, so if you see that the taxes and fees are a little bit higher, that, that affects the value. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the big thing with the the taxes and fees uh, is just that, like, I organize this so that it's sort of by uh, by alliance, and so it's nice to look at these head to head. So let's start with uh, Sky Team, mm-hmm. um, Air France versus Delta. So economy, uh, we've got Delta is roughly two point nine cents mm-hmm. per point, and Air France is three point seven seven cents per point. Mm-hmm. So quite a bit more value there. Uh, And on top of that, Air France does charge quite a bit higher taxes and fees. So the average economy uh, taxes for Air France is $127. So I guess when we're talking about taxes and fees, the way the listener should think about this is just out-of-pocket cost. Yep, what you're going to have to pay. Um, And so the the real story here is that Air France just costs way fewer miles, but you're going to pay a higher taxes and Mm -hmm. fees surcharge. Uh, Delta's average for economy is 28 bucks. Right. now, on the business class side, uh, the interesting thing to me is that neither of the cents per point move hardly at all. Yeah. So Delta is still right around uh, 2.9 cents per point. I think that's a reflection of just how much higher the prices are. Because if you look at Air France, economy pricing is generally pretty good, but their business and first class is pretty expensive. Yep. Which is much like Delta, where if there is a good deal on Delta, Delta does have some good deals in economy but there's rarely what we would consider a great deal in business class comparatively to how many miles are required. Exactly, the number of miles is, is really what influences the most because the taxes are, are relatively small compared to the price of the, sure. the cash ticket. And so the number of miles is what moves this a lot. Like head to head, Air France one way to Europe is 25,000. Uh, Delta one way to Europe is 30 or 40,000. Now it's 40 almost across the board. And that's a great, yeah. you know, that's a good day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the business class, we just said Air France is normally 62. Sometimes you get a promo award in there. Right. That helps because those factor into the, right. the valuations as well. Um, and, you know, with Delta, you're looking at 70, maybe 85,000. Maybe more. I mean, maybe, maybe a lot more. Um, okay, so that's the head to head there. I don't think I mentioned the taxes. So with Delta, taxes go up quite a bit for business class. It's 125 average uh, per ticket. And Air France is about $204 average. So uh, those are among the higher ones uh, that you're going to pay mm-hmm. out of pocket. Um, Next up, we've got a three-part Star Alliance. Alliance. There's actually four, but we don't have any data for ANA uh, on economy because basically they just don't normally have a great value there. Um, And by the way, these are for tickets that we booked at least 10 uh, Mm -hmm. round-trip tickets. Um, So for these ones, I think the biggest story is that in economy, uh, if you're trying to save, you know, keep taxes and fees low, uh, Aeroplan can be a great program. Uh, and so can United, but United keeps it very low on the the business and first class taxes and fees. So you're looking at about $70 average for taxes with United in economy and also about $70 in business and first. Mm -hmm. And the big reason for that is that they don't do any uh, fuel surcharges on on award bookings. And so uh, Generally, when you see the out-of-pocket costs go up for the premium cabin, it's because they charge way more for Mm -hmm. fuel surcharges and other sort of premium taxes. So uh, United is a great uh, minimizer of -of out-of-pocket costs, by far the best amongst the, the Star Alliance group. Uh, Singapore hopefully is going to be a little bit better now mm-hmm. that they've changed their rules about partner bookings, not including uh, fuel surcharges. Right. 
Um, but yeah, so overall, uh, the head to head comparison here for economy, we've got Aeroplan coming in at about three and a half cents per point, Singapore coming in uh, over four and a half, and United coming in at about 2.8 cents mm -hmm. per point. And again, that's Singapore and Aeroplan have been slower in economy to raise their the number of points required for right. trips. Um, then in the uh, the business class, I think the biggest change there is that we've been successful booking a lot of really expensive business class tickets with Aeroplan. And so that's one of the ones that's over five cents per point. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for granted, not everybody that gets a $6,000 business class ticket has that valuation of the, the ticket. Right. You're not saving six grand if you would never pay six grand for that flight, but it is part but of the inherent value. it doesn't mean value. that you are not getting a flight that you would have had to pay six thousand dollars for. Yeah, no. you're sitting next to the guy that did. Right. You yeah. know, in most in most cases. Um, so the the last one here is ANA. The reason I wanted to mention these guys is that ANA has way better prices in the number of points that are required for a ton of destinations, but they require a round trip. So you mm -hmm. got to kind of commit fully, commit to the yeah. ANA. And I think looking at ANA, I think that's why our valuation is a little bit lower than Singapore and United is because those are only round trips where we've had our fair share of Singapore and United one-way award bookings where you're paying 50% miles and the retail cost is maybe 75%, right. sometimes more. Point. So um, as far as like the, the, I don't know, the most honest value of the points is that if we really, if we got a little bit more granular, I think we'd see ANA outranking Singapore and United. Yeah. So ANA also, uh, the drawback with them as well is that it takes a little bit of time to transfer, whereas uh, Aeroplan and United are both instant transfer partners uh, mm -hmm. for, for their respective programs. Although I will say I transferred United to Chase uh, Chase to United just the other day and it did not post instantly for the first time ever. It took more than 24 hours and I still have to figure out That's if I concerning. lost my ticket. Um, so beware on that. That's uh, just sort of a surprise random announcement that I forgot to put in the notes. But uh, I looked it up on Flyer Talk, and this has happened to other people too. So if you're looking at a transfer from Chase to United and there's you know not necessarily a bunch of seats available, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend transferring 1,000 points first and making sure it posts yeah. instantly. Um, all right, so that kind of wraps it up for, for the Star Alliance uh, group. The, the last two that we have rankings for are, are One World Airlines. We got American and British Airways. This one I found super interesting because of how different uh, the pricing mechanisms are. And yet, uh, they came in this relatively very, close. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, and I think this is just a, a matter of us using the right program at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's really important here to get maximum value. So, Americans pricing is based on region. US to Europe's a flat price, US to South America's a flat price. British Airways is based on distance. And so, uh, both of them for economy are around $75 in taxes or out of pocket mm -hmm. costs. And both of them for business are averaging just over 100. Uh, Americans a little bit better at 102, and British Airways a little bit higher. Just under 120. Just under average. 120. Um, but as far as the, uh, the valuations here, American, this is where I just, the points guys got American at 1.4 cents per point. And we've averaged 3.34. And by the way, this is one where like the ones that, okay, maybe we've got 10 or 15 tickets. Right. That's a little less reliable because one ticket could have really moved the numbers. But American, we've booked like 80 tickets uh -huh. in the last year. And so there's a lot more behind this. And we're consistently getting big time points value out of American miles. Um, and we're successfully finding ways to get people to Europe uh, using Finnair, using Iberia, or using American mm -hmm. operated flights to avoid those British Airways fuel surcharges. Um, so overall, uh, I think that American is still one of my favorite programs. Um, and there's a great deal right now with the City Platinum Select card where you can get 60,000 points, which is a round trip to hey, Europe. As you say, there's your round trip to Europe. Yep. Pay, pay $75 in taxes and fees and uh, visit pretty much anywhere you want in Europe. Uh, we'll put that card in the show notes. I don't think that's going to be around much longer. Uh, uh -huh. It's been about a month and a half. Typically, these run from 30 to, to 60 days. Uh, I definitely think it'll be gone by by Christmas. Year, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, get that card and use it for some some Christmas present purchases. I know I'll be doing mine last minute this year. So Yeah, no shit, um, me too. 
All right, lastly, nobody really, uh, the points guy does publish some, uh, some valuations for transferable currencies. Uh, the way we've got this one um, marked out is that we just take every time somebody actually uses transferable points and transfers it to a partner, we just take whatever the valuation contribution was for that partner. So if you transfer United uh, Chase to United and you get two cents per point, we credit the Chase miles with that two cents per point right. value. Yeah. Um, Same thing in Air France, Singapore, whatever, however that shakes out with all those. Yep. Uh, so overall, uh, all of these, we didn't split out the, the economy and the business class for this group. Uh, but I think the big news here is that everybody but Starwood uh, was above four cents per point. And that's the one that really doesn't make sense. This is the one piece of data that I just do not trust. I don't know why. I mean, this I, came I, I think way. it's a sample size issue where is. I think if we added a zero to the the raw number of flights that we've booked, we'd see SPG be right up there, if not leading leading yep. the leading the charge. Um, but that's uh, yeah, that's another thing about the transferable points that I feel like um, some some qualitative data needs to be applied is the fact that you have more options makes them more valuable. Like whatever the math works out to, like okay, this is worth four point five cents per point, and then like a little asterisk that says and also way more options and a way less likelihood that you're going to not be able to use the points for the flight you want. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the conversion rate, if you will, on being able to successfully turn Amex points right. into a flight is way higher because you've got 10 transfer partners. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's definitely a big part of this. Um, so that's going to, I guess, wrap it up for today's show. Uh, we will publish these, uh, these charts here on the website so you guys can have a look for yourself and kind of see what our, our numbers are. And, uh, again, this is not advice that if you see a price that you can buy points, you want to pay cash at the, the points value. I think but if you want to think about the value of your portfolio, that's, yeah, that's a good way. Yeah, to look. I think the way to look at the valuations that we we just talked about from our booking services, you know, when you really, really, really take booking flights seriously, this is the value that your points can get. Yep. All right. Uh, anything else to add, man? Man, I think I think that's it. What is this? One ninety eight. This is one ninety eight. So, I mean, We're coming notes, up on the bicentennial. Show notes are at uh, broaders com slash one nine eight. Thanks for being with us wherever you are. Travel safe. Hey, broaders, don't be shy. Hop over to the website and join our email list for exclusive travel hacking content. If you like what we're up to, the best way you can support the show is by leaving us a five star review on iTunes. Lastly, we would love to hear from you, so send your show feedback to Eric or AJ at abroaders.com. We will see you next week.